Where did the Felix uh, go? He's not in the in his office, no? Okay, that's wow, wonderful. Wow. Good morning, our viewers. Welcome to ACFIM's edition of our weekly new edition every Wednesday. We shall be having an edition uh, discussing matters of money in politics. So today, as the world is commemorating the International Democracy Day, ACFIM joins them in celebrating this day. The International Democracy Day is celebrated around the world every 15 years of each year. Uh, it was established through a resolution passed by the UN General Assembly in 2007, encouraging governments to strengthen and consolidate democracy in their respective countries. The International Democracy Day is an, important, is an, is an opportunity to review the state of democracy around the world. We all know democracy is as much as a process, uh, as a goal, and only with the full participation of the international community, it can help for us to build an ideal democracy to be made into a reality and be enjoyed by everyone and everywhere. We do understand there are values that need to be upheld. For example, the freedoms, respect of human rights, the principle of holding periodic elections, and also ensuring that uh, people are freely to participate in most of the democratic spaces they are in. So today we have an in-house discussion. We are going to review and reflect on Uganda's democracy, the state of Uganda's democracy. We do know there are various principles which very many people in the world are uh, identified and come up with and do, do, do believe that each and every government that's democratic must have. Those principles include citizens' participation, equality, political tolerance, accountability, transparency, regular and free elections, economic freedom, control of abuse of power, the Bill of Rights, which you can also still call human rights, accepting the results of election, multipartism and constitutionalism and rule of law. But today our main focus will be on uh, key areas which we want to our discussion to be focused on. We shall focus on civic space, human rights, election and multipartism, and constitutionalism and rule of law. So we have an in-house panel from ACFIM, which is going to take us through their own experiences and their own expertise on understanding democracy, how democracy should be, should be moving out, democracy should be is shaped, and they will give us their views on the state of Uganda's democracy. So I'm joined by Henry Muguzi. Henry Muguzi is the Executive Director of Alliance for fin Campaign Finance Monitoring, is an experienced and seasoned expert in electoral democracy. He has, is well grounded and is going to share with us his experiences and expertise in the area of electoral democracy and the state of democracy in Uganda. We shall also be joined by Mr. Felix Kafuma. Felix Kafuma is a programs manager at Alliance Finance Monitoring. He is also an expert in the area of electoral democracy. He has worked in, in the field of democracy for so long. He's so seasoned, so we believe his experiences and expertise will be beneficial and gainful for this discussion and will guide us on how we should move on as a country in terms of advancing our democracy. Then I have young people who will, who will also join us in this space. We have Gerald Coraneza. Gerald Coraneza is a political scientist by training, and I know he will bring his knowledge from the field of political science to share his insights and what he thinks Uganda should do in order to improve on their democracy. Then we have another young person who is a lady Elizabeth Karunji. Karunji is a, a development a development person by training. She did develop, de development studies. So we believe in any world where development might be ensured, we need to have a democratic system in place for us to be able to develop. So she's going to share with us our insights from a development angle on how Uganda should move forward. So those are the, the guest panelists we are going to have today in this discussion as we commemorate during the, the entire world is commemorating the International Day of Democracy. 
I will start with Henry. Uh, I want you to share with us your own insights. What do you think is the state of Uganda's democracy currently? Thank you very much, uh, Abel, and of course, uh, quite an honor and pleasure for me to be here to speak about a subject that is very dear to my heart, and that's the subject of democracy, and of course, also to, uh, uh, to express our my happiness at joining the rest of the world in commemorating this uh, International Day of Democracy. Although, for the case of Uganda, I'm not sure whether we are commemorating or mourning. Now, <clears throat> so um, um, the key things you look at is uh, you want to reflect on uh, uh, the events that are happening in Uganda, events that have uh, um, happened over the past uh, one decade or so. And uh, the, the takeaway you pick from those uh, uh, events is that uh, the space uh, for political actors and civic actors to engage meaningfully with the people in power has been uh, not only shrinking, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, being taken, being taken away. Um, if you look at uh, 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 the other dynamic of uh, elections, which is a foundational characteristic of democracy, uh, we seem to have mastered the art of conducting elections, not necessarily in a democratic way. Um, in terms of the fundamental freedoms that must be enjoyed, again, we have issues there. Um, and particularly, we have issues with our electorate. Electorate we have is the one who thinks that the people who come to contest, to offer themselves and contest on um, elections are so stupid that they are able to go to 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 to, uh, um, uh, to, to, to uh, inundate them with the lots of gift foods, give them money and then uh, they pay them so so that they can go and serve them so our electorate is not the one that is able to uh, understand that he who gives you uh, money and those other freebies is trying to blindfold you and confuse you on something. In which case, then you ask the question, do we have citizens or do we have occupants of the country? And can you uh, have democracy when people do not treat uh, and behave uh, as citizens? So these are key uh, areas to ponder about. And for me, uh, who belongs to that generation, I think uh, when you look at where uh, the country has come from and how uh, the political terrain has been shifting. Uh, you know, the, 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 the one thing you cannot uh, miss picking out is to worry about the future of democracy in Uganda. And perhaps now that we get to, celebrate, to commemorate uh, this International Day of Democracy, it could be uh, a time for introspection uh, introspection on the part of those that uh, occupy positions of power uh, um, and ask themselves the question of where exactly they want to take this country. Well, in summary, that's how I can, uh, I can, uh, I can put it. Thank you, Abel. Thank you so much, Henry. Felix, you've heard Henry try to give his insights on the state of Uganda's current democracy. He has mentioned issues concerning a shrinking civic space the quality of the electorates we have, which are not of standard, to enable us to have that kind of democracy we need, we aspire to have. So in your own take, what do you think is the current state of democracy in our country? And what do you think needs to be made so that we can have that advanced and stable democracy, so that everyone can be able to appreciate that, yes, Uganda is really a democratic country? OK, uh, thank you, Abel, and, uh, and all our viewers. Um, I think this is what I can I can say. I can uh, I look at Uganda in a phase of decades. For example, the first ten years, uh, 1995. Let me first ignore the first uh, from 86 to 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 95. But let's look at it from 95 to 2005. We saw uh, um, a country that seemed to embrace the idea and the notion of of democracy. And uh, in those ten years. We, we saw the aggressiveness and the desire to, to uh, improve our constitution. Um, at that point in time, we, we saw institutions being put in place. We saw 
a number of accountability agencies being birthed and uh, and the the euphoria within uh, one would easily say that okay um, the country was in a new dawn having come off um, a, a, a period where uh, regimes um, were changing like one changes clothes uh, but the, but after 2005, and I think um, um, in, on when we now translate into multi party politics, um, again, there was another decade between 2005 and 2010. We start to see slowly the regression in terms of the democratic growth in the country. But I think it became more apparent in the next, in the, in the, in, in the decade that followed after 2010 to 2015. And, uh, for me, uh, 25 and then to 20, now 2020. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, I think we began well when you look at uh, uh, how, um, as a country, we 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 were very um, ambitious in putting in place uh, legislations, putting in place institutions that foster accountability, transparency, all those good things around. Democracy. We 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 did transit into my party politics. I know it has its challenges, but I, I can say we began well. But along the way, um, uh, we we lost it, and I can say for now that we are having a regression or a downward spiral in terms uh, in terms of how our democracy uh, has 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 been uh, moving in the last. Uh, 10 to 15 years. Henry has talked about the shrinking civic space, but we've also seen the increase in human rights violations um, um, by state agencies. We've seen how uh, we've, we've, we've seen cases where also uh, beyond the human rights violations, where we have the rule of law and constitutionalism, we, until now, the country is yet to recover from the, the amendments that have have been made into the constitution of Uganda, um, the 1995 constitution. I think the spirit behind that constitution is along the way we lost it because uh, as we talk now, um, the constitution of Uganda is undergoing a lot of amendments, not, not necessarily um, in the interest of the people, but in the interest of regime entrenchment and survival. So you see, uh, that there is a regression in that area in terms of our democracy trajectory, uh, but also when you when you look at uh, aspects to do, uh, probably I also touch the issue of civic space, uh, which seems to be no more apparent, is that which is continuously shrinking. Um, you can say um, that where we are as a country, um, our democracy is on a downward spiral. Um, and I think it's important for us to, to reflect and uh, uh, see how all of us as citizens can reverse the trend we are taking, but it's not a beautiful trend, that I might say. Thank you so much, Felix, for those insights. Now I want to go to a young person, that's Gerald Coroneza. We know uh, globally, the history has always informed us and has showed that young people had a, a large stake in fighting for the freedoms in various countries, especially in Africa. For example, Uganda here, we had young people like uh, those of Apollo Milton Dobote coming up to fight for independence of the country uh, and also other places in the world. We had we saw in Ghana Kwame Nkrumah mobilizing as young people and championing the agenda of fighting for the freedoms of the people. That are, those are all principles of democracy. What is your take on the current state of the young people in trying to shape Uganda's democracy? Thank you uh, for that uh, very uh, good question. Um, uh, our U Uganda democracy is uh, in, in nascent, it is uh, in nascent, it is developing. Uh, we've consistently uh, held uh, periodic elections. Uh, we've uh, tried uh, to have these very elections of which um, like of late, I just see them uh, uh, in terms of uh, rituals. Uh, these elections, uh, they are held, in other words, to just uh, 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 for legitimate reasons, just for the regime to uh, legitimize the regime 
Uh, so uh, the electrons which we usually uh, heard, uh, uh, have of rate, uh, they are not genuine uh, in the sense uh, that the people's will and the, uh, a lot of uh, uh, errors are usually done. So we believe uh, that we need to do better in terms of the periodic elections which we do uh, uh, hold. Gerard, Gerard, your network is breaking. I, I really don't know what's wrong with your network. I think we shall get you back when your network is good. So I would like to go to Elizabeth. I hope you're on. Elizabeth, I want you to share with us uh, your insights on what you think uh, democracy is, uh, the set of democracy in Uganda, in your own understanding on how you observe it in the current context. Yes, thank you, Abel, for having me. I'm pleased to be part of this discussion, especially today being International Day of Democracy. Well, looking at Uganda's performance in terms of democracy, I think we are doing fairly. I can't, we can't look at democracy as a whole. When we began the show, you listed different essential elements of democracy. So I think we need to break it down and look at it in terms of all those aspects. But for me particularly, I'm going to look at it in terms of equality. And I'm going to look at women in this case. I think legally, we do have provisions for increasing women participation in elections, in governance. We have um, laws and affirmative action. And over the years, we have seen an increase in women particip participating in elections. However, we shouldn't look at it just at the legal provisions. We need to look at the reality of the situation and ground. Women face different barriers, especially in terms of economic barriers and cultural barriers that hinder their participation. So I think we need to move further from just having laws in place to enable women to participate, but start economic, econom, economically empowering them to take on various positions, to stand and contest just with their male counterparts and not leave all the positions to the men. So I think we still need, we still have a lot to do in terms of achieving democracy when it comes, when it comes to equality and freedom. Yeah. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, now I will go back to Henry. Henry, you shared with us very insightful uh, insights when we, when we started. You discussed about the thinking in terms mm -hmm. of the quality of the electorates are not so good for democracy to progress in Uganda. But I want us to go back to, first of all, from the historical perspective. We, know, we do believe that when the current regime, the NRM government, the National Resident Movement came into power, one of the things they promised Uganda was fundamental change. And that change came into various, they had various points, one point program which they, they wanted to achieve. One of them was uh, ensuring that they promote and protect the fundamental rights and freedoms of the citizens of Uganda. But we have, we have seen currently that the regime and the civil society are at loggerheads, especially those civil society organizations doing uh, work around governance and human rights. So we, Ugandans are, are, are not government needs to be complemented on its work or they just need they don't want to say that calls them to account for some of the actions that they do which are retrogressive in nature so i want you to help us understand what is your take on the current loggerhead between civil society and government should we say government is looking at civil society as an enemy instead of looking at them as uh, as a, a group of persons that are civically organized and are able to help the country progress and improve on democracy. Thank you very much, Abel. Uh, of course, that's a very interesting question uh, because then it uh, uh, takes us to reflect on the history of, uh, of uh, the regime we have in place. When you, uh, if you reflect on what the regime came uh, drumming uh, uh, in 1986, uh, the 10 point program, um, which had uh, very interesting points among them, <sighs> Uh, the, 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 the protection of the rights of, uh, of, uh, of citizens and uh, also telling us that one of the reasons they had taken up arms was to make sure that they protect, they fight the people that were violating the human rights, but also issues of democracy. Then, uh, 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 and then you look at what is happening today, you really wonder. Now, it seems our understanding of what human rights are 
is different from what the regime does understand. Now, when you look at what's happening today, you cannot speak about human rights and forget that one of the fundamental uh, human rights is the, the freedom of speech, okay? Freedom of, of, of association. And these are two fundamental principles when it comes to citizen organizing. Now, citizen organizing, of course, uh, uh, manifests in many forms. One of them is the uh, creation of uh, a civil society. From what is happening today, you tend to see that the regime, uh, the, the government in power is quite uncomfortable with the civil society. Over the past uh, uh, 10 years, there has been a deliberate onslaught. It started in the form of enactment of laws and then the creation of institutions and then it has gone on to, 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 to you know, the, the laws that were enacted, if it's, uh, some of them were quite, were quite draconian. Uh, the most infamous one was the, the Public Order Management Act. And then, of course, you have the NGO Act. Then you have the Computer Misuse Act. You know, you have all these acts that are intended to make sure that they strengthen, uh, they serve the purpose of strengthening the, the, the regime's handle. On, 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 on national affairs. And therefore, when you have a civil society that comes out to hold the regime uh, 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 accountable and ask those questions, but also advocate for human rights, I think it does push the people in power in, in a very uncomfortable position. You will understand that from the movement government, movement system, which was introduced when the people came, to, when the current regime came to power, it had one, uh, 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 what is called one patron at the top uh, of the tree, and uh, this was the president. So it does seem that even when we transited from the movement system to the multi party system, we never really uh, the minds stayed there. And therefore, in the movement system, it would be unthinkable to have this group of citizens that are being so critical of the things, the bad things. That the regime is doing okay and therefore you can see that there's discomfort the 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 actions of the institutions that are were set up to serve the uh, uh well-intended purposes institutions such as the financial intelligence authority institutions such as the the the, the, the national bill of ngos whose spirit is actually to create a conducive environment for civil society these institutions have been weaponized instead against civil society and citizen organizing. So, from the way things are happening, the closure of 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 uh, of, uh, of the, the closure of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, organizations, the holding of the operations, the 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 the, the, the freezing of bank accounts, the um, you know, and all these actions, the the raiding of. Uh, of uh, of uh, organization offices, the arrest of of citizens uh, of civil society members that had been accredited duly by the electoral commission on election day, arresting and detaining them for three days. You know, all these point towards a situation where you cannot really say we are going to commemorate democracy. I think the better thing to do is to is to, to, to request that the people in power do an introspection because. We are not headed towards democracy. We are headed towards something else. And therefore, uh, until citizens are able to, uh, to feel that freedom, organize freely, you know, until state institutions are left to do their work, the work of ensuring that the national interests are protected, until citizens are under, citizen organizing is understood in a way and manner that it is not intended uh, to bring down a regime, it is intended to improve management of public affairs until we get that tolerance that 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 in any setting that is called democratic or what the name uh, democracy there have to be views that are pro and views that are against so when the views that are against emerge you 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 don't construe them as a, as a, as the people that are intending to take our power as a matter of fact Many of the people that occupy spaces in the civil society world are not interested in power. All they're interested in is a country that is serving their purpose, a country that they can be happy to live in, 
a country that uh, can enable its, its, its citizens to enjoy their fundamental freedoms, including the pursuit of happiness. That is the country we want to aspire for and want to be in. That's what we want to see. Thank okay. you. Okay, and thanks for those uh, insights. Uh, now I will go to Felix. Uh, Felix, you've just had him to share uh, some of the issues that are affecting our democracy and why we are not progressing very well. He has talked of how citizens are not able to organize themselves because some of the spaces they are using to organize are being targeted and being shut, for example, civil society organizations. So you, as one of the experts who has been working with various civil society organizations and also on the area of democracy and electoral democracy for so long, I would want to hear, we want to, as the audience, would want to hear from you, what would you tell the organizations in civil society and government to work on so that they, they look at each other as people complement each other's work but not uh, looking at civil society as enemies or foreign agents as one of the head of states likes uh, labeling them. Uh, you see, government, the, when we are discussing, gov, you see we have what we call a government and a regime. So uh, I think government knows what civil society is and their contribution to the country, Uganda. But I think it's the regime that is misinformed. And I want to draw this distinction because uh, uh, when you talk to technocrats, um, that uh, interface with uh, with government, with civil society, technocrats within government that interface with civil society. Um, you, they understand and appreciate what uh, what civil society is doing in terms of complementary role, in terms of filling the gap where government is, because we we know. Government can be everywhere, and because government can be everywhere, there a civil society comes and fills that gap where government is not in, uh, uh, in position to be, and uh, plays the complementary role. So uh, I think government really appreciates what civil society is doing, and 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 and. Uh, but when it comes to the regime, now when I talk about the regime, I'm talking about individuals who occupy government structures but they are individuals who are aligned to the system who are diehards to the party and the person of the president who do who feel that anybody who talks what is not happening right is against the government or is against the regime these are individuals uh, who have painted a picture that civil society is antagonistic, civil society is opposition, civil society uh, should not exist or should not operate as it should operate. Uh, civil society should be controlled in a manner that it is made weak. Civil society uh, should be uh, contained. These individuals are unfortunately have a lot of power they have more power than than the government institutions so uh they decide how they should uh relate and they also decide what the public should know they also decide what the pub what the president should perceive unfortunately these individuals that i would call uh the regime apologists um then tend to construe and misunderstand civil society in its totality. When you have such a situation um, um, of, of now having individuals who operate both formally and informally, taking a position on what civil society is and how civil society should be seen, perceived, and treated, it becomes a bit of a challenge uh, uh, on, 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 especially on how now aspects of civic organizing aspects of uh, uh, civil organizing through, for example, through civil society should be achieved. But that said, uh, the back has to stop with the citizens themselves. I think what civil society can do is to play catalyst role. A catalyst role in the sense that we can continuously empower the citizens 
to understand their state, to understand their role, to understand their power, the power they have, uh, the influence they have, the responsibilities they have as citizens to change the situation as they see it. I don't think that any person is going to be given these freedoms, these fundamentals on the silver plate. They have to be demanded and there has to be some bit of, uh, in the way you demand them, some bit of pressure has to be applied. When you attack civil society as an organized group, it should be an opportunity for now these other civic spaces, these other individuals, these other people, the citizens themselves, to organize themselves and find a way of claiming this space, which seems to be uh, under attack. And uh, what civil society can do is to raise the red flags, of course, continue to engage, but like I told you, we are not necessarily engaging with, with, our, with government, we are engaging with individuals that are regime diehards. So even the way, we, I don't know how you engage constructively with such individuals who seem to be having a different doctrine and an understanding and appreciation. But at the end of it all, it's the citizens themselves that are supposed to take charge and demand for this space and put government on pressure and see this pressure come to bear. Uh, when you isolate civil society in itself, you are not isolating citizens. Citizens themselves have to rise up have to realize that uh, this is their space. They must protect it, they must demand for it, and they must take it. And uh, they shouldn't expect that this space will be given to them. In any case, it is in the interest of the regime to, to continuously police and reduce and control this space. Then that means it is the, it is the, it is the duty of us citizens to demand and claim this space. And I think for me, that's now the conversation we should be having. We need to take this fight beyond the civil society organizations and bring in all these other actors, private sector players, their citizens, religious actors, their citizens. Everybody is a citizen and has a stake. It should become part of the agenda to claim this space. Wow, wow, wow. Those are very insightful insights, Felix. Thanks for that. I would like us to, uh, we are going for a short break and then we shall return uh, and then we shall also engage other guest panelists. COVID-19 lockdown has left us poor. Money from candidates won't make you rich. Do not be desperate. Focus on issues, not money. Often money used in campaigns is dirty money. Do you know its source? Corruption, mafia, drug trafficking, human trafficking, theft from national budget, self-seeking foreigners, selfish businessmen, selfish money lenders. Don't abandon your duty. Elect quality leadership, not big spenders. Welcome back from that short break. Uh, today you join ACFIM. Uh, ACFIM is joining the rest of the world in commemoration of the International Democracy Day. Uh, the theme of this year is strengthening democratic resilience in the face of future crisis. We have had various discussions already. Uh, they have shared their insights. Uh, I have Henry Muguzi, who is the executive director of ACFIM, and also have Felix Kafuma, who is the programs manager at ACFIM, and then our young young people at ACFIM, Gerald Coraneza and Elizabeth Karunji. Uh, Felix, you gave us very good insights on how uh, the informal structures are becoming uh, more, more powerful in the government and making it very hard for citizens to participate. I would like to inform people that, you know, in, in every democracy has, it's just, we evolve as I would, and I would like to quote one of our great, philosopher, great philosophers in the area of democracy. So he passed on, that's Kofi Annan. He said, nobody is born a good citizen, no nation is born a democracy. Both are processes that continue to evolve over a lifetime. 
So I believe as Uganda, we shall continue evolving. We shall keep on showing the government and the regime in place those mistakes they have so that they can be able to improve. Uh, Gerald, you had very good insights on issues concerning how elections are not so much credible and uh, the integrity of elections are, are questionable. So I would like to build on from, from, from there where you were discussing about elections. Well, you know that Uganda returned to multipartism in 2005 and we have political parties in place which are supposed to compete for power. They're supposed to bring into place candidates which citizens have to choose from, the best candidates. Uh, in your own view, do you think the current political parties we have in place have the capacity to keep Uganda's body politics into good, in good health? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Abel, um, for that very good question as we discuss on democracy. You know, uh, political parties, they are looked at the vehicles of democracy. Uh, without a political party, you know, uh, these political parties, they help in organizing and the political parties uh, play a, a pivotal role in developing our democracy. Um, the regime or uh, the ruling government, the, the government that is in place, uh, it has ignored um, the, the pivotal role that is, is played by a political parties. Um, uh, ever since they introduced uh, the, 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 uh, the, the multi-party democracy, uh, they brought in this very amendment, the 2010 amendment, where they brought in issues to do with the public funding. But uh, we, I believe that we cannot uh, see uh, parties do anything when they, when they are not getting money, uh, like this kind of funding. You know, money is part and parcel, and uh, we believe it is a mother milk in our politics. And they need the money to organize, uh, to, uh, to organize the electorate, uh, to build the party structures. So uh, the, the, the government has uh, consistently undermined, you know, political parties by not funding them. Uh, you know, it's supposed to fund their day-to-day -day activities uh, as the provided uh, by uh, the, 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 the 2000 uh, political parties and the Organization Act of 2005. So uh, we, we believe, I believe uh, to uh, enhance our democrat, uh, democratic growth and the building like these very institutions, which actually at times like these very political parties, the uh, opposition uh, political parties, they keep you know checking the government what is it doing. Maybe you know they give alternative policies, alternative views on how things are done. So uh, we need. Uh, to do better in terms of strengthening these very political parties um, by uh, funding them uh, on their day-to-day -day activities uh, so that they can move the uh, entire country um, and the, we see uh, how we can enhance this democracy that we are talking about. Otherwise, uh, democracy, we shall not realize it by ignoring to uh, fund these very parties. Like, for instance, you may, uh, as you can see uh, in the concluded elections, um, political parties, they have been bewarming. They've been saying uh, even this money, which they usually uh, send them, uh, it, it, it doesn't even come in time. The, of course, I mean, these, these are monies which usually come uh, on day-to-day -day activities, and they are supposed to be given uh, monies uh, uh, in respect of elections. We've seen uh, uh, ever since this uh, this this uh, amendment was put in place since 2010. We've heard, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, three periodic elections, uh, 2011. Uh, we are supposed to get money from uh, uh, from the government so that they can, you know, reach out uh, to, uh, to 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 citizens uh, to the electorate, you know, uh, as as in the, when they are giving them their manifesto. So I believe. Uh, uh, we need to see the constitutionalism when we when we we, we bring a law like, like in in place. You know, uh, you know, you cannot talk about democracy without you know um, uh, putting in in the practice the rule of law. Hmm? So the law provides that you are supposed to uh, finance political parties within elections, but we. we 
who, who uh, ignore and our country need uh, public financing to strengthen these very institutions which are the vehicles of a democracy. Thank you, Abid. Wow, wow. Thanks for those insights, Gerald. Now I go to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you just heard what Gerald has been talking about. And we know one of the principles of democracy is about regular, free, and fair elections. I would like to know from you. You know, Uganda has had uh, elections uh, for about four general elections ever since they returned from multipartisan in 2005. So, but I want to understand from you why have election results considered as being refuted by candidates who are not declared winners, particularly like those in the presidential race? Um, thank you, Abel. My connection had an issue, so that's when I've been off, but I'm glad to be back. So there are a number of reasons that opposition political parties usually raise. I'm going to begin with transparency. We have all seen how our elections are handled. There's a very big gap when it comes to transparency. And then also there are limitations. We have seen campaign rallies of opposition parties being blocked on several occasions, even just looking at the just concluded elections. We saw in different parts of the country this the, the Electoral Commission and the police were using the guise of COVID-19, but we all know that it was more than that. Very many candidates from the opposition side were constantly arrested, beaten, and they were not given the chance to ably campaign just as the ruling party. Then I think one of the other issues is um, campaign finance, just like Jared has spoken about. Those are my, my thoughts. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll turn now to Henry. Uh, Henry, Gerald, and Lisa have shared some great insights concerning uh, money in politics. So I, I know you have done a lot of work around money in politics. And around the world, there are scandals involved in money in politics, which, which many people claim do delegitimize democracy. In your own view, how feasible is it for democracy? Okay, thank you, Abel. And uh, so, but I want to pick it up from where Elizabeth and uh, Gerard left it. Uh, Elizabeth uh, talked about the elections, and uh, I think our elections, uh, in one way or the other, uh, 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 are difficult to, 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 to describe. I have chosen to describe them as a kind of a bipolar situation. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is this, that uh, on one side, the elections are conducted to legitimize uh, one person in, in one position. That is at the top. In other words, there is no, uh, I, I think uh, you will not find a Ugandan who thinks that clearly through elections you can change uh, the position of the president. But also uh, the, the other side is that, uh, of course, we've seen uh, elections resulting into uh, high turnovers in parliament and at local government level. So there is one position which does seem to be ring fenced and which there can't be touched by elections. And then there is a, there's other, others that can, can be, you know, where, where things are normal. That's why I, I decide to call it bipolar. And I also wanted to pick it up from the political parties because uh, the political parties in Uganda, a lot of, a lot of people have argued that uh, they have a very weak about political parties that people to raise own uh, money, okay? They cannot raise their own money. They don't have that capacity, they cannot mobilize resources. And the question is, if you cannot mobilize resources, why do you need power? Will you be able to then uh, handle power? Okay? And then, of course, the issues of, uh, of uh, political uh, godfatherism, uh, which I think we also have to look at, uh, where every political party has this king figure uh, that runs it. Now, the reason I have chosen to, 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 to reinforce uh, those ideas on political parties is because... 
Uh, we are we are having network issues. Uh, Andrew is breaking, uh, but he has been sharing very insightful uh, sharing with us in his insights. So I want to now come to Felix as Henry is re reconnecting. Felix, you shared with us very good insights, or, or especially regarding how the current regime operates, especially in terms of it uses more of informal structures in executing most of its uh, mandate. And these informal structures look to be more powerful than even the formal structures in place. So I want to understand from you, don't you think that's, that's a sign of uh, captivity of some of the state institutions whereby you we have uh, the formal structures not being followed and more of the informal structures, the ones that are operating. And don't you think that has a correlation with captivity of state institutions? like your question is quite leading to to the fact that you actually in a broader sense of of things if you are to discuss them is to to look at the functionality and the effectiveness of state institutions now when you talk about state institutions in this case uh these are institutions through which government ideally should be functioning and uh, but when you have uh a country that has state institutions on one side uh, but also has um, other informal structures on the other hand some of these informal structures can operate within a formal system but only use a formal system as a cover i hope i am making sense in this case the, the formal, they can operate within a formal structure, but the formal structure is more of a fahed or a cover to legitimize their informality. But they remain in formal structures because they either get orders from elsewhere, they, they report elsewhere, they are more powerful elsewhere. We've seen this. And, uh, and there has been an argument uh, uh, over time um, in perspective looking at uh, whether... Um, how how the public institutions have been have been run down and rendered toothless and powerless and i don't think that uh, argument or narrative is is unfounded because we know very well for example when every state institution be it a ministry is having challenges the only person they look up to will be the the man at the top of the tree the man who is occupying the highest office to solve that matter. Even when he sends a minister who is directly responsible for that problem. For example, we've seen traders strike over time. We've seen teachers strike over time. We've seen medical or health workers strike over time. But when negotiations hit a snag, they will always tell you they want to have the final say from the man with the hat, from the highest office, even when the ministers that are responsible are within their mandate are sent to negotiate and resolve issues, um, the striking entities will not feel comfortable or will not feel confident from the negotiations unless the president himself pronounces on the matter and uh, and uh, and uh, decides on the matter. So you continuously see how power has been centralized in one structure. And uh, all these other structures now, the idea that should be the structures through which government is run, remain ceremonial and, uh, and uh, only serve probably to entrench or propagate patronage. People in those systems and structures do not have the final say on such matters until the president says so. So you already see how the state in itself is not functioning independently uh, of the other. Uh, you see power fused in one structure, power fused in one system, power fused in one individual. And uh, that's not how democracy is designed. Democracy is designed to allow the different power centers exercise their mandate checks and balances here and there and 
ensure that there's a balance of power. Now, unfortunately, over time, over time, we've seen the executive as one arm of government swallow up these other forms of government or these other arms of government, the legislature and the judiciary. So uh, where we are now as a country, uh, and I'm trying to paint a picture of how these institutions have been captured and they are not functioning independently and how that is bad our democracy because it means that every challenge or situation must be resolved by the state house now the state house has also put in place informal structures that can influence the final say within the state house making them more powerful than actually than actually this the, the formal structures through which the government should function so we are in that state that state of state institutions being captured or being in captivity as i may put it like you rightly assert to thank you so much felix now i want to end to build on that very point we we do believe, we do know that uh, this current regime is one is one that came up with a model where it wanted citizens to participate in aspects of governance and they came up with a decentralization policy but now we are seeing more power is being centralized and the decentralized districts are not having enough power to exercise their powers why are we still having more proposals and more districts always being created and administrative units being created in a run-up to elections, yet on ground we are seeing that they don't have powers to perform their duties and functions. Thank you, Abel. Before uh, before I went off, I think I was making a point. And let me just take uh, crown that point. The point I was trying to make was that uh, uh, we, when it comes to democracy, Uganda is quite uh, uh, still lagging uh, behind. Uh, I say this in appreciation of the fact that when it comes to the democracy, you can never find anything called a finished article. Democracy, we do know it is always a uh, work in progress. But for the case of Uganda, you, you realize that there is a, a charter, uh, an African instrument called the African Charter on Democracy, election, on elections, democracy, and governance. Uganda has never ratified that charter. Because it speaks about things that would improve democracy, but in the process of improving that democracy, then it would weaken uh, the regime. But going to your question of decentralization, we do know for a fact that decentralization uh, um, uh, as a theory and concept is good in as far as uh, taking power to the people is concerned, in as far as uh, increasing, uh, uh, creating platforms for people's participation in politics and public affairs, in as far as uh, improving uh, government transparency, in as far as uh, making sure that uh, there are, uh, government is present at the lowest level in order to be able to understand and appreciate the needs and aspirations that are peculiar to certain peoples. But democracy, uh, but decentralization, the way we have it in Uganda, has been reduced to a, 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 a structure of patronage. Patronage because most of the districts we have are districts that cannot even generate 1% of their annual revenue, or I mean of their, of their annual budget. They have to depend on the transfers from the local government. If the local government, I mean from the central government, if the central government delays to release funds, they will be there hanging by, by a thread. This is patronage. Because ordinarily, the patronage system does not, uh, cannot allow and permit any government structure to exist and operate independently. Because then it breaks away uh, from the, 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 the from paying allegiance to the patronage structure. But it also takes away the people's co concentration. Look at it this way. If districts were able to provide for all the needs of their peoples, then the people would have nothing to do with the, with the government. Uh, they would, not, would have nothing to do with the man who sits in the office of the president. And therefore, there would be a situation where the president could be passing around and people don't care because all their problems and needs are settled and, and finalized by the local government. 
So in a setting such as ours, they cannot, you cannot allow this happen. So they, he has to now maintain them as patronage structures. You remember, we talked about this earlier when we were doing a study on state capture, when we said that uh, uh, the NRM government regime that has been in office for over five years still has hangover from the, the way it behaved when it was in the bush. Remember when they were still in the bush, wherever they captured, they introduced a system called resistance councils, so-called RRC. For some of you who are young, you may not have found this. For some of you who are over the other day, we, we, we lived in these RRC systems. The RRC system was intended to uh, as, as, as an organ of mobilization for the party. Okay, I mean for for, 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 for the NRA, NRM so that it can ultimately capture power. Now, fast forward, decentralization is introduced, and in the thinking, so it seems, in the thinking of the regime, these decentralization structures, which we are, we are still, I mean, in the beginning of the system, we are calling them uh, resistance council, I mean, uh, resistance councils, then we change it to local council. The change in the name has not changed the mindset of the people that have invented this, this system. And therefore, until now, there's a reason to believe, and rightly so, that the regime considers decentralization structures as structures for community mobilization, mobilization for votes, mobilization for support, and therefore, they cannot serve the purpose of decentralization as we know it as a concept, as a development intervention. And therefore, I think uh, um, the route that has to be done to make sure that decentralization operates as it should, not uh, a facade that we are seeing today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. Uh, we are running out of time, so I'm going to give each of us one, one minute to give their parting shots, especially on how we, we are to improve our nascent democracy of Uganda in line with the principles of democracy, which we are, we are early on hinted of citizen participation, equality, political tolerance, accountability, transparency, Federal and fair elections, economic freedom, control of abuse of power, and the Bill of Rights, accepting the results of elections, human rights, multipartism, and then constitutionalism and rule of law. I will start with you, Felix. Uh, uh, Abed, before Felix comes in, uh, I wanted to uh, make a rejoinder on uh, where uh, Henry had, had stopped on the decentralization policy. Okay. You know, I, I want I wanted to look at it in a, terms of inclusiveness and the uh, participation by bringing uh, uh, these very categories, the, the special uh, interest groups, like for instance the youth. Um, I will, in one way or the other, uh, respectfully uh, disagree with maybe Henry, maybe in terms of the uh, bringing the people onto the board. Uh, Decentralization policy it was a very good policy, but of course, it lost a meaning uh, when we, 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 we politicized it in terms of, you know, um, as a network for the regime uh, to mobilize its support, you know, uh, capturing uh, all, uh, even the lowest, uh, 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 lowest unit at the village level, which, uh, which we, we, we refer to as Gachacha, at the LC1. Uh, but in terms of inclusion and participation, we've seen um, in terms of our democracy, you know, our growth, we've seen uh, special interest groups, like, for instance, people with disabilities, uh, people like women. Um, we've seen youth. Youth have just, uh, that, that's the only space which, uh, for now, youth, they, they usually they have, because uh, youth, they've gotten this very bad and they cannot uh, participate in the general election, like for instance, uh, participating uh, at the constituency level, uh, they have been uh, uh, shattered, uh, uh, you know, being, uh, they have this very burden of, uh, com uh, they don't have money, you know, commercialized electoral politics. So they've seen that one as the, uh, the last resort. So um, in terms of uh, uh, local governance uh, um, at the, the lowest level, We've seen people uh, coming up from LC1, then they go ahead to the parish, then they go to the sub-county, and they have uh, uh, participated in one way or the other 
in terms of you know government programs so um in terms of uh, uh growth of our democracy and the you know inclusion and the participation i will uh, i will try to give the, the, the government like at least 20 percent or 30 percent in terms of participation and the bringing on table um uh, uh, those category category groups i thank you so i think still there are the quality of participation still is still very low and uh, it doesn't uh, meet the expectations of uh, ugandans which uh, we had aspired when democracy i mean the centralization policy was brought on board so I think uh, Henry's arguments are still very valid. And I do believe we need to do more in terms of improving our decentralization policy if we want to progress. Uh, maybe as we continue, Gerald, before you, you leave, you can also go ahead and maybe give us a parting shot since you are, you are already speaking. Oh, um, thank you so much. Um, you know, Uganda, we have... Uh, a wrong way to go in terms of our democratic growth and the, i will look at it in this very angle we need uh, as one of uh, this political philosopher um, montesiki uh, he has always argued on the doctrine of separation of power we need at least to see a separation of powers in our state institution uh, the government needs to act inde independently. This government institution, the organs of a government, the parliament, uh, the judiciary, and the executive, I think we need uh, a lot to do so that they keep on, you know, check one or the other in terms of, you know, um, uh, as they perform their obligations. So we need to do a lot uh, when it comes to. Uh, 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 acting independently. Uh, to, um, in terms of inclusion and participation, uh, youth, we need to reclaim our space. Uh, the youth, uh, the engine of democratic growth and development. And the, I would do in, encourage the viewers, uh, uh, particularly the youth, uh, who are looked at in terms of uh, 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 agents of commercialized politics instead of uh, participating they are uh, in other words uh, participated by politicians the politicians they usually give you a lot of money so the youth the youth person who is watching out there there is no one who will uh, bring this very space it's, it's us to change the tables and the uh, see how we can reclaim this very space which uh, uh, the government is also shrinking in one way or the other. So, um, you know, Rome wasn't built in one day. So we are very expectant and the, we, the, civ uh, the civic actors who are in these various spaces, we are very ready to fight for our democracy. I thank you. Thank you so much, Gerald. Uh, Felix, are you on? You give us your uh, take. Thank you so much uh, to all our viewers and thank you, Abel. I think for me, the parting shot is that uh, this country is at a point uh, where I'm among those who subscribe to a, a national dialogue to, to have to have concession on some of these things that um, that are, for me, they are fundamentals in growing our democracy, but also talking to each other. And uh, we, we need to have a honest conversation on some of these sticky issues that the country is confronted with that are partly touch the foundations of democracy that we want to see. And for me, that national dialogue is very important to chatter a way forward that is common. We need to have a meeting point, all of us as Ugandans who have a stake in this country. That's the way to go. Thank you so much. Uh, Elizabeth? Is Elizabeth on? I think Elizabeth has network issues. Henry, you can give us your parting shot. Yeah, my part, my parting, my parting shot. I'm just shot going to add on from what Felix said. I think it's okay. Fine. Okay. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, Elizabeth. We can hear you. Proceed. Ah, uh, yes. I was saying I'm. Just...
adding on from, from what Felix said. I think that you can hear me. Yes. Proceed. Yes, I was saying dialogue is very important for us to achieve democracy. And like people always said, democracy is a Western concept. It's not a one size fits all. So I think as Ugandans, we're going to have to sit down and see what works for us. Felix earlier mentioned that democracy in Uganda is taking the downward spiral. So if it hasn't been working for us all these years, after all these elections, we probably need to sit down, figure out and restructure what works for us. But that's keeping in mind the essential elements. We shouldn't let go of that, but we just need to figure out what works for us. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Henry, you can now chip in and close. Yeah, yeah. So my, my take, my final parting shot is that um, I think we need to exercise more tolerance, tolerance uh, between the two major protagonists in the political arena, the opposition, but also the uh, the part in power, because it is only through political tolerance that we are going to be able to conduct and carry out the national dialogue that Felix and Liz alluded to that would help us agree on what kind of democracy we want to have. I thank you very much uh, for, 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 for tuning in, but also for listening to us viewers. Thank you so much, everyone, for giving us today your time and your views. I appreciate all of you. You have been a very wonderful guest on panel. I want to appreciate everyone outside there watching us. Today it has been a very wonderful day. As we commemorate this day, Please, let's be champions who advocate for the fundamental freedoms uh, of each and everyone in our country. Let's not be part of those people who are infringing on the rights of the person. If we are having issues in our country, please, let's dialogue. Let's not confront everyone and have hate speech. Let's work together in building our country. You know, no country can just develop in, two, in one day. It's a process, so we need to work together as various stakeholders, depending on where, where we are in make sure that we build Uganda into a better state and country. Thank you so much. COVID-19 lockdown has left us poor. Money from candidates won't make you rich. Do not be desperate. Focus on issues, not money. Often money used in campaigns is dirty money. Do you know its source? Corruption, mafia, drug trafficking, human trafficking, theft from national budget, self-seeking foreigners, selfish businessmen, selfish money lenders. Don't abandon your duty. Elect quality leadership, not big spenders.